Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to the seminar. Um, I'm just going to attempt to use the share screen. Yes. Good morning. Um, I'm Andrew Singer, um, and I'm be introducing and chairing and speaking at the end of uh, beginning and end of this seminar, along with my uh, distinguished colleague, Professor McGee. Uh, this seminar is on limitation and mistakes of law, uh, particularly um, in light of the very recent uh, decision of the Supreme Court. And um, thank you all for joining us this morning. I'm just going to make a few uh, background points about the, the background to the Supreme Court decision. I should let uh, remind everyone before I start that we are recording uh, this seminar. The, um, the background to the Supreme Court's dis decision is that this case arises out of some very long running proceedings uh, known as the Franked Investment Income Group litigation. They commenced uh, as long ago as 2003, and there were a, a large number of claims concerning the way in which advanced corporation tax and corporation tax was charged on dividends received by UK resident companies from non-resident subsidiaries. There were some other group uh, claims for repayment of tax and interest raising uh, similar issues as to limitation and as to remedies in restitution. The claimant uh, case before the Supreme Court was that the differences in tax treatment were a breach of the EU treaty, if we can all remember that, uh, guaranteeing freedom of establishment uh, and free movement of capital. And the claimants were seeking repayment of tax wrongly paid and interest dating back to 1973, which was when the UK joined uh, the EU. Uh, which was then, of course, known as the EEC. And the claims were brought in restitution, for which, um, as you'll hear from Professor McGee, that, uh, and as you probably know anyway, there is a six year limitation period subject to exceptions, uh, including Section 32 of the 1980 Act. Uh, the claimants said that time was postponed under the Limitation Act until 2006, when the Court of Justice of the EU, as it's now called, uh, decided that certain parts of UK law were incompatible with EU law. And the Court of Appeal uh, agreed with that. Um, in the Supreme Court, the defendant, uh, who was the taxman, uh, HMRC, argued that uh, Section 32 doesn't apply to mistakes of law and or that the mistakes could have been discovered more than six years before 2003. So that's the background to the limitation issues, which my uh, distinguished colleague, Professor McGee, is going to consider. But before he does, can I also point out that this case is worth consideration on a preliminary issue, which the Supreme Court also had to determine as to whether the revenue was barred from making this argument at all, because due to an operation of estoppel or race judicata or abuse of process. Now, those issues are outside the scope of this seminar, uh, but uh, they are um, worth a mention and they're worth a look at. Uh, and there's also an important issue as to whether where's and how a court should allow a party to withdraw uh, an admission and to amend their pleadings, uh, which the Supreme Court actually did in this case. Um, so with that in, in line, um, I hand over to um, Andrew McGee to discuss the matter for the case further. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Andrew. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, Andrew Singer has introduced some of the background to the case and spared me the need to uh, explain the rather complex background facts of this litigation. I think the one thing I would add to that is that much of that detail is not of 
general legal importance. It's of extreme importance to the taxpayers concerned, of course. Uh, but for our purposes today, the point is that this is a claim to recover money paid under a mistake and specifically a mistake of law. Um, there are the two questions that, that are shown there on the slide that's on the screen at the moment. Does section 321C apply to mistakes of law at all? And if so, <clears throat> when does the cause of action accrue? And linked to that, when does time start to run? And of course, those two questions there, when does the cause of action accrue and when does time start to run, aren't necessarily quite the same. Uh, as a general principle, as a starting point, they are, but not always. Um, now, uh, yes, thank you. Andrew, if we can have the slide headed 321C. Thank you. Uh, I've set out there section 32.1. Um, uh, where in the case of any action for which a period of limitation is prescribed by this act, and then it lists three situations in which the period of limitation doesn't begin to run until the plaintiff will have discovered the fraud, concealment or mistake, as the case may be, or could with a reasonable diligence have discovered it. And I've bolded on that slide at uh, paragraph C, because that's the one that we're concerned with in this case, where the action is for relief from the consequences of a mistake. Um, I will say a little bit more about the relevance to this case of paragraphs A and B, because as we'll see, the Supreme Court do uh, at least a little bit discuss the operation of section 32.1 as a whole. But I've put out there for you the whole of section 32. Uh, one, so that you can see what the legislation says. And then if we could go to the next slide, please. I've just put a bit of history there. Um, I'm sometimes a bit skeptical about history in these matters, but uh, I do think there is some relevance here. Section 32 started life as section 26 of the Limitation Act 1939. And this is something to which the Supreme Court gives some attention. Before the 1939 Act, the three situations listed in section 32.1 were not in a statute at all. They had developed over the years as equitable exceptions to the general rule set out in the previous Limitation Act. And indeed the 1939 Act was the first general modern statute on limitation. I'm not sure we quite count 1939 is very modern anymore. <clears throat> But the, the very first Limitation Act, of course, the first General Limitation Act was the Limitation Act 1623, although there had been various statutes on limitation in real property through the 19th century. But in 1939, what that Act did was to bring together much of the pre-existing legislation and put in a, a general statute. And that was modified and updated in the 1980 Act, which is still the principal statute, but the history and the equitable development of these exceptions are of some significance when considering uh, what they mean and how they work. If we can have the next slide now, please. Uh, no, previous one, both the same one, thank you. Now, I put in mistakes of fact. Um, section 32.1c only talks about the action being for relief from the consequences of a mistake. And until relatively recently, it's been rather the poor relation of section 32, subsection one, in that there haven't been very many cases about it and about what, quite what's meant by relief from the consequences of a mistake. But there had been since at least 1841, uh, in the days when all this was a matter of equity for limitation purposes, there had been a recognition that you bring a claim to recover money paid under a mistake of fact. And the authority for that is Kelly and Solari uh, in 1841. Uh, Kelly and Solari, as happens, is an insurance law case, money paid by an insurer in relation to a claim, uh, and he said it was paid under a mistake of fact. And in K Kelly and Solari, the courts recognized that in those circumstances, that there was, in principle, the right to recover the money paid. Um, for those who want to go and look at the judgment, paragraphs 102 to 140 of the judgment uh, relate much of the pre-1939 history, 
and the way in which the equitable exceptions were developed. Um, then we've moved on now to the second slide, the second bit of our mistake, the fact of the Vestuja Landesbank case, uh, and also um, Aspect Contracts and Higgins in 2015. Yeah, and in those, it was held that Section 5 of the Limitation Act applied to such claims. Section 5 is the section, of course, which deals with actions based on simple contract. I just comment in passing, it always seemed to me rather odd to say that a claim based on the argument that a contract was in fact void can scarcely be described as an action based on a contract. However, 2015, um, the Supreme Court disagreed with me about that, and Section 5 does apply to claims for money paid for, for contractual type claims, quasi contract claims of money paid under mistake of fact. And because Section 5 applies, Section 32 also applies. Now, that's mistake of fact, though. And the next slide uh, is headed, just go back one. Mistake of law, yes. Now, there's an earlier case, Bilby and Lumley. Uh, Bilby and Lumley is also an insurance law case, as it happens. It's also based on a mistaken payment under an insurance policy. But in that case, the underwriter's argument was that he had made a mistake about what the law was. Uh, and that had caused him to pay out the claim when he shouldn't have done. Always seemed to me that he deserved relatively little sympathy. But the point of Bilby and Lumley was that it's the case that settles that payments made under mistake of law were not held to be recoverable. So there was a clear distinction at that stage between mistake of fact and mistake of law. One allows the possibility of a claim for repayment. The other one does not. And the consequence of that is that the 1939 Act and the equitable principles which it consolidated cannot really have had the possibility of claims made for payment under mistake of law in mind. If he would ask the draftsman of the 1939 Act, was 32 c meant to apply in, in cases where there is a mistake of law, he would have thought it was a silly question. His answer would surely have been, there is no claim of any kind in those circumstances. So section 32 cannot have any application at all. Well, so far, so good. But then we come on to 1999, the Kleinwitz-Bensley case, which is one of the cases arising out of the interest rate swaps involving local authorities. And in that case, the House of Lords I've written abrogated the Bill B and Lumley rule. Of course, the House of Lords, like the Supreme Court, um, doesn't, doesn't uh, overrule its previous decisions. It merely departs from them. And in theory, uh, of course, no court in this country makes law. It merely declares what the law is. I think that's pretty much of a fiction. I think most common lawyers probably think it's a fiction. The truth is, that if you read the lengthy judgments in Kleinwitz Benson, they explain at some length why the rule is not a necessary one, is not a good one, and should not be followed. And they say in future, it will not be followed. Well, that was a considerable change in the law in 1999. Uh, but of course, one of the questions thrown up by Kleinwitz Benson, but not discussed in Kleinwitz Benson, because it wasn't directly relevant in that case, is does section 32, particularly 32.1c, uh, apply uh, to claims for payments made under a mistake of law? Well, as a piece of literal interpretation, you can say this is under section 5, as we know from aspect contracts, so section 32 must apply. And that's an example of what's sometimes known as the always speaking view of statutory interpretation that when you get a statute that you don't just look at what, what it meant at the time, uh, you have to consider how it applies to circumstances which have arisen since then. But at the same time, there is supposed to be a principle, as we all know, that what the courts do is they give effect to the intention of Parliament. But it's clear, as I mentioned a moment ago, that Parliament in 1939 
cannot have contemplated that section 32 or anything else would apply to payments made under state law because there was no claim in those circumstances. And that's the essential dilemma that the Supreme Court has to consider on the first point in this case, does section 32.1c apply to claims of this kind? On a fairly literal view, you could say, no, it can't have done, that can't have been Parliament's intention at the time. It is perhaps not surprising that the Supreme Court did not in the end uphold that view. They discussed the arguments at some length and gave some attention to the kind of theoretical, jurisprudential, and dare I say it, academic arguments, uh, which would suggest that um, Section 32.1c couldn't apply in the circumstance. But it's also, I would say, fairly obvious that if you hold that 32.1c does not apply in these circumstances, you create uh, an anomaly in the law. If we are to recognise both claims for money paid under mistake of fact and money paid under mistake of law, why should section 32.1c apply to one of those heads of claim, but not to the other of those heads of claim? And that I would suggest is quite a difficult question to answer. Really, it seems more sensible to say that section 32.1c either applies to both or applies to neither. We know from the earlier authorities that it does apply to mistakes of fact, and therefore it makes sense to say that it applies to mistakes of law. Uh, and that indeed is the view that the Supreme Court took. Uh, I summarise again very briefly a fairly lengthy passage in the judgment where they say that it's consistent with both policy and logic to hold that section 32.1c does apply in these circumstances. And for once, it doesn't happen that often in limitation cases, for once I find myself agreeing with decision of the highest courts in relation to how the Limitation Act works. So that deals with the first of the questions. I've perhaps made it seem simpler than the Supreme Court made it. They discussed the issues at some length, but if you're looking for a, for a takeaway for your uh, practical purposes, it, it comes to this. Section 32.1c does apply to claims for money paid under a mistake of law, and apparently in just the same way as it applies to claims for money paid under a mistake of fact. However, once you decide that, you come on to the second question in this case. The second question being, when does time start to run? And perhaps we should again divide that into, into two. When does the cause of action accrue and when does time start to run? Well, the cause of action must presumably accrue when the loss happens, and the loss must happen at the time when the taxpayer pays the tax, which is subsequently found not to be due. That's the relatively easy bit. But when we come to when does time start to run, because section 32.1c applies, we know that the limitation period of six years does not start to run until the claimant discovers or could with reasonable diligence have discovered the existence of the cause of action. It's easy enough, I think, to make that work in relation to mistakes of fact. Um, when it comes to mistakes of fact, you can say, and it's a factual inquiry, when should the claimant have discovered the mistake of fact that he had made? And that may involve complex evidential questions, but conceptually, it's not difficult at all. We know what the question is, and the courts are quite capable of answering these evidential questions. Even in mistake of law, there may be cases where it's not that the law has changed, it's simply that the claimant, the original payer of the money, 
did not originally recognize what the law was and subsequently discovered the mistake. Now that's not this case, but I'll, I'll just say a word about that situation. I would have thought that where that situation arises, the claimant is not going to get a great deal of sympathy from the courts. Accepting that this is the state of law, accepting that the money can be recovered, and accepting that section 321c applies, you still have to ask the question, when could he with reasonable diligence have discovered the mistake? And if the law has not changed, presumably the answer to that question is, he could have discovered it at the outset if he had taken proper legal advice and taken heed of that legal advice. So I would suggest that in that group of cases, there is not likely to be a significant gap between the point at which the cause of action accrues and the point at which uh, time starts to run uh, under section 32.1c. Is it different, and if so, how, in circumstances where the law has changed or has been declared differently? Because then a claimant is likely to say, well, at the time when I paid the money, this is particularly so, I suppose, in the taxation cases, I paid the money because I believe and everyone else believed that the law made this money payable. Uh, and that's particularly so, I suppose, when he says, uh, I paid it not because of a judicial decision, I paid it because of the clear words of the statute. And my view of it and my advisor's view was, if the Taxes Act says that this money is due, well, then the money is due, and that's the end of the matter. And I could not know until a much later stage that that was wrong. Uh, as Andrew explained at the top of this seminar, what happened in the, the Frank Investment Group cases generally is that there was a decision of the ECJ that said that certain provisions of the Taxes Act were incompatible with EU law uh, and had themselves be disregarded. And Deutsche Morgan Grenfell, uh, in, back in 2007, the Supreme Court, which still has the laws in 2007, but never mind, addressed that question and held that time didn't start to run until the, claim, until the claimant knew for certain that he had a cause of action. And that was offered as a general principle for when time starts to run uh, in claims for money paid under mistake of law. And in the taxation cases, the argument is then run, I couldn't know for certain until there was either a statutory amendment or as here a decision of the ECJ that decided the particular provision was invalid. Before that time, I might well have had my doubts about it. I probably knew that the matter was proceeding before the Court of Justice. I might have thought it likely that the Court of Justice uh, would hold that the provision was invalid, but it hadn't happened, didn't happen until the Court of Justice has made its decision. And so it's only when the Court of Justice actually makes its decision that the provision is invalid, that the time starts to run. Now that was Dr. Morgan Grenfell, and that case felt to be uh, reconsidered uh, in the case that we're considering at the moment. And uh, Pat Moss, forward one, yeah, thanks. Um, the consequence of the Deutsche Morgan Grenfell decision is, of course, that there could be no running of time uh, in cases where you, where you bring proceedings for the recovery of money paid on the state of law until you win the case. Because it's only when you actually succeed in the claim that you know for certain that you have a course of action. Until then, you may believe that you have a course of action, uh, but you don't actually know for certain that you do. And that has a further rather bizarre consequence. The claimant would start proceedings 
he would start proceedings because he believed that he had the cause of action. Why would you start proceedings otherwise? But because he didn't yet know that he had a claim, time would still not have started to run. Now, most students of the law of limitation, I think, would find it quite difficult to contemplate a situation in which the claim is ongoing, proceedings have been issued, but time still has not started to run. And it is, in retrospect, slightly surprising that in Deutsche Morgan Grenfell, uh, the House of Lords came to a ruling which seemed to produce that consequence. And that fell to be considered again in the present case, although it was still a relatively recent decision, 2007, uh, a decision of the highest court, uh, which claims to be reluctant to depart from its own previous decisions, nevertheless, it fell to be considered again. And if we go to the next slide, Yes, and the Supreme Court do consider at length the earlier judgments in Dutch and Morgan Grenfell. And you see this spectacle of the present members of the Supreme Court with due judicial courtesy, telling their predecessors, many of whom are still alive and will probably read the judgment, that they got it wrong. Because the Supreme Court say that on the running of time, uh, Deutsche Morgan Grenfell is simply wrong, and therefore they depart from the earlier decision. If they depart from the earlier decision, you then have to ask yourself, well, what test do they substitute? The test they substitute is, when could the claimant discover that he had a worthwhile claim? That's not, of course, the same thing as when could he know for certain that his claim was going to succeed. That was the Deutsche Morgan Grenfell test and the Supreme Court here say that it's wrong. So we just need to focus for a moment on when could the claimant discover that he had a worthwhile claim? And the answer to that must in general be uh, at the point where he has enough evidence to come to the conclusion that he has a reasonable prospect, a real prospect if you like, of succeeding in a claim. Um, few people, I suppose, when they start proceedings, really know for absolute certain that their claim is a good one. You don't know that until the judge comes back and hands down the judgment. And we all know that judges make odd, odd judgments at times. But that doesn't stop the time from running. And it's fairly obvious, I think, that the uh, test laid down here is going to mean that time will start to run earlier than it would have done under Deutsche Mühle and Grenfell. It will certainly start to run before the proceedings are actually issued. So we can no longer have this anomalous situation where the claimant has started proceedings but can still say that time has not started to run. And a point which is perhaps of some interest to those of us with an interest in limitation. Uh, is that the new test consciously aims to produce some degree of alignment with the test in other areas of law, firstly with mistake of fact, but also with sections 11, 14 and 14a of the Limitation Act 1980. Now those sections, of course, 11 uh, sets out the, the basic period for personal injuries, 14 sets out the test of discoverability for when time starts to run uh, in personal injury cases. And 14A has a similar but, but not quite identical test for other negligence claims. 14A, of course, having been added by the Lake and Damage Act 1986. And something that the Supreme Court do place some reliance on is the idea that it is desirable in principle to have similar tests for um, discoverability under section 32, discoverability and date of knowledge under section 14, and what section 14a calls the starting date, uh, all of which are clearly very similar concepts. And many of you will know there's uh, a mass of authority, particularly in relation to section 14, on when 
a claimant acquires the necessary knowledge to start time running. And there's also a growing body of authority in relation to section 14a, uh, of which perhaps the leading example is still Hayden uh, Fawcett back in 2007, where they talk about the claimant having enough knowledge to justify, and embark, justify him embarking upon the preliminaries to issuing a claim. And it seems to me that as a result of the present decision, that effectively is the test for discoverability under uh, section 32, all parts of section 32, because A, B and C really must have the same test. That's the, the same test as we have under section 14 and section 14A. So that I think is more or less where we have reached as a result of that decision. Uh, and I just put some very brief conclusions on there, which I'll run through for a minute. Um, the decision, of course, glosses over issues with the declaratory theory of jurisprudence. Uh, it would have been possible to say that since courts don't change the law, none of the subsequent decisions which change people's previous understanding actually changes the law and people should have known the law from the start. That's um, an unrealistic the theoretical and jurisprudential argument, and it would have been most unattractive for the Supreme Court to adopt that as their theory uh, in the present case, uh, and they didn't. Um, Deutsche Morgan Grenfell was always unattractive on the question of when time started to run. The illogicality of the decision in Deutsche Morgan Grenfell is, I think, quite well explained by the judgments of the Supreme Court in the present case. And just now leading on to what, what Andrew Singer is going to be saying in a minute or two, the DMG problem is, of course, most acute with invalid statutes. We still necessarily start from the proposition that when Parliament passes an act, that act is valid. And there are relatively few ways in which such statutes can be invalid. I suppose, as a result of political events in the past year or so, there will be fewer than ever before because the role of the Court of Justice of the European Union is presumably going to diminish to, to more or less nothing. So the question may, may not arise in that way, but it can certainly arise with uh, changes in judicial decision making. And the overall effect of this, bearing in mind what they've done to Deutsche Morgan and Grenfell, and bearing in mind the way that they've done something which I don't think I've seen done uh, in case law before, I, I've written a few things about it, but I don't think I've seen courts do it before, is that they have consciously tried to harmonize section 11, section 14, section 14a, and section 32. And that seems to me to produce an improvement in the internal consistency of the law of limitation, which I would certainly welcome. Now, where does that leave us? Well, the question that you may then be asking at the end of all that is, what are the implications of this? In what circumstances looking forward, are there likely to be more claims and how might those claims be dealt with? Uh, and that provides me with a convenient point at which I can hand over to Andrew Singer, who is going to attempt to address those questions. Andrew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Uh, I, I'm, I am going to uh, very briefly uh, address the issue of uh, future claims. Um, of course, uh, the, the problem with an ad addressing a future claim is that you don't know what they're going to be at all uh, yet, uh, other than uh, fairly obviously uh, in the field of, of tax uh, in respect of these claims, um, which are the subject of this case. But thankfully, uh, for my part, certainly, I don't practice in the field of tax, uh, nor do I intend to do start doing so now. Um, so really the question is um, whether there will be um, issues with um, what the Supreme Court themselves describe as stale claims being litigated years after the payment was made. And um, that obviously is brought into a light by the case itself, because as, as we said in, in, the, in the first part of this, of this seminar, um, this claim relates back to payments which were made in 1973, uh, which is clearly a while ago now. And 
uh, most of us as lawyers, if a client walked into our office and said, I'd like to sue someone in respect of something that happened in 1973, um, in a commercial case, would undoubtedly start by saying, well, I'm sorry, I think you're a little late. Um, without, may I suggest, even having to look at uh, Professor McGee's book. Um, so the, the fact is that the this case does, in, in one sense, already lead to what some people might describe as a stale claim being litigated uh, years after payments were made. But it, I think the real question is whether this is a case where, uh, which really deals only with its own fact and deals only with its own claim, namely this, this, this rather unusual tax claims, which arise out of a, a situation which, as Andrew's pointed out, as we all know, isn't likely to take matters very much further in the future because we're no longer in the EU. Um, but the majority of the Supreme Court said that, that there isn't going to be um, a large number of claims which suddenly start to be litigated uh, on the back of their decision. Uh, so uh, Lords uh, Reed and Hodge, who gave a, the joint majority judgment, uh, and, uh, paragraphs 229, for example, uh, talk about this case as being of a wholly exceptional uh, nature, or pausing there for a minute, most cases that get to the Supreme Court are of a wholly <laughs> exceptional nature, because it wouldn't be in the Supreme Court in the first place if they weren't. Uh, but uh, they also uh, noted, paragraph 239, that courts don't often overrule established rules of law in the course of giving judgment to overrule an established rule of, of law. Um, but perhaps uh, more, uh, more importantly for, for us thinking about future claims, uh, the, the, the majority are very keen to point out that in a claim for restitution based on a mistake, the defendant could rely on the defense of change of position, um, which is um, an, a, a, a def defense which people can often rely on. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's sort of an estoppel-based point. It's obviously in, virtually impossible for a government, like a, a department, like the tax man, to rely on change of position. Uh, but private individuals and, and corporations may well be able to do that, um, which might, the Supreme Court suggested, even if there are future claims out there, the majority say, well, even if there are future claims out there, the majority of them won't succeed anyway, uh, because the defendant will be entitled to rely on defense, the defensive change of position. But of course, that, that, that won't stop the claims being brought in the first place necessarily. Uh, and it won't stop people being exposed to litigation in respect to what might otherwise be described as, as very old um, payments, uh, indeed. But that's the, that's the majority's view. The minority's view uh, is that there is a, a, a good deal of uh, potential for such claims. Uh, and but for those of you who, who want to look at it, the judgment is, the minority judgments are interesting at paragraphs 289. Uh, and 291. And a point which is made is by reference to a, another recent decision of the Supreme Court in the case of Rock Advertising, which some of you will be familiar with. Uh, rock Advertising was the case about the what's described as the NOM clauses, the No Oral Modification Clause, uh, where the Supreme Court held that that, that was effective and, and meant what it said. And so if you want to vary a contract, with a no, no oral modification clause in it, you have to do it in writing. But at paragraph 18, the Supreme Court discussed whether if they were to consider the second point that arose in rock advertising, which was about the, the rule in respect of consideration, the variations of consideration generally, uh, they were, would have had to consider the rule uh, in, the, in a case called folks and beer. Uh, which is um, from 1841, and which itself derives uh, from a case called Pinnell's case, uh, which is in 1600s. Uh, and the point um, that was made by the minority in, in this case was that had the Supreme Court in mock advertising decided to depart from uh, folks' beer and then from Pinnell's case, they would have been potentially uh, opening up 
settled transactions which had occurred in this country for over uh, 400 years, uh, which is uh, clearly on any view um, an alarming prospect. Uh, not least is that an alarming prospect because rock advertising left it wholly open that the Supreme Court do in fact want to reconsider that question. And in fact, I think it's ripe for reconsideration, I think the words used by uh, Lord Briggs in rock advertising. So on, on the back of that, and on the back of this case, is, is it possible that a whole series of commercial trans transactions will be um, capable of being impugned for being subject to a mistake of law, if, if indeed that, that rule, which is some 400 plus years old, uh, is departed from, to use the uh, uh, correct vernacular. So the quest one of the points that that leads us on to is, um, first of all, can, will there, are there, is there a potential for future claims? Uh, in my view, um, there is at least a likelihood that if the law does change, most probably for the reasons Andrew's given, because of judicial development, that people will try to look back at previous payments and see if there is a prospect of recovering them. Uh, in the field that I practice in, uh, construction, that one could see that, for example, changes to the way in which the courts interpret the adjudication provisions could well uh, give rise to arguments that monies were paid because of the previous law, which would, uh, for example, as to the way in which notices, pay less notices are interpreted by the court uh, and could well lead to claims being brought uh, after the six year period. Uh, and it's worth noting in that context, that aspect in Higgins was of course a case about uh, adjudication and repayment of monies paid under an adjudicator's award. Um, so that's, I think there are, there is a, a chance for future claims. Um, but also there is a chance perhaps that in the light of this decision, that the Supreme Court itself and the Court of Appeal might think, well, we need to be a bit careful now uh, about what we say about previous decisions. Because if we change the law, apart from previous decisions, uh, that there may then be a whole series of claims as a result of it. So it's possible, I suppose, that the decision might act as a check uh, on changes to um, precedent and to, to the development of the common law. I, I would suggest that would be a bad thing because one of the great points of, of the English common law is that uh, it develops to deal with modern situations uh, in a way that other forms of law are, are said not to do. So how might the law develop from now? Well, well as ever, that involves crystal ball gazing, um, which lawyers in general, and I suggest even judges in particular, are not very good at. But um, certainly it may be that in cases uh, where payments are made, um, people might reserve their position to reclaim it later, uh, should the law change. If payments are made in cases in areas where the law is subject to a current well-known challenge, uh, perhaps before making payments, clients might go and speak to their lawyers. That might be a practical way in which the law might develop. Uh, will there be claims brought for money back? Uh, I would have thought almost undoubtedly so. Uh, will there be a lot of them? Uh, probably not. Um, and probably not that many outside the sphere of, of tax, at least to start with. Uh, but um, there could well be a, a number of areas where this arises. Um, so it's certainly well worth uh, thinking about uh, when somebody does walk through the door, if they do and say, uh, I made a payment a while ago to somebody and I think I might not have had to do it. Um, so for that reason alone, this case is certainly, um, we would suggest, uh, well worth considering uh, as part of uh, the litigator's armory and as part of a, a transactional lawyer's considerations uh, as well. So um, that leads us to um, a few minutes uh, for any questions. I will um, 
just stop screen sharing for a minute and see if uh, any questions have come through on the Q&A function. Um, I haven't seen any uh, questions at the moment myself. Uh, there is a Q&A and a chat function if anybody wants to raise a question. Please feel free to do so. I've, I've seen the question as to uh, whether this recording's been re this matter's been recorded, and as I said at the beginning, yes, it is. Um, I'll just allow a minute so for anyone to ask questions. Uh, well, there won't appear to be any, so um, but still, I, I hope that. Um, you enjoyed the seminar uh, and thank you for attending. Uh, Kings will be holding further seminars uh, throughout our practice areas uh, in due course, but I'll draw this seminar now to a close and wish you all a, a good day and uh, stay well and hope to see you all uh, uh, when we are freed. Thank you, have a good day. <laughs>